everyone. Um, attention. This will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information printed on the agenda. Instructions on how to make a public comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. All public comments shall be addressed to the board of directors and limited to three minutes per speaker. The board of directors may choose to respond to comments or request staff to respond at the conclusion of the public comment period. So just to ad lib this a little bit, during public comment, we're going to hear all public comment from any public commenter in any section before responding to any of the public comments, just to clarify that a little bit. Um, so starting with item A, call to order and roll call of directors. Uh, Tiffany, will you do us the honors, please? My pleasure. Board President Ruggieri. Here. Director Case. Here. Director Kilkenny. Here. Director Oyserman. Here. And Director Shea. Present. Thank you. Thank you. And moving on to item B, agenda. Um, looking to adopt the agenda. Any, um, any comments from the board? Lisa, I have a small request. Um, Luke and the rec staff are actually away at a conference this, uh, this meeting. Luke's taking this call from his hotel room. Um, if I could move Luke's recreation and park maintenance activity report or request to move it to just ahead of the fire department matters, um, then he can cut off as soon as that part is concluded. Okay, so it sounds good to me. Is that okay with you, Chief? Absolutely. Awesome. All right, then we will flip-flop items G and F. Thank you. Any others? All right, any public comments on adoption of the agenda? Sure, one second. Yeah, uh, hello, can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, Steve Nussel. And um, uh, so the agenda is very light tonight. And I'm kind of wondering why, because we have a lot of issues going on. And I'm wondering, uh, I, I don't know why it's so light. Maybe not, not a whole lot was done, but. Uh, uh, we have the trail to talk about, we have the playgrounds to talk about, we have the maintenance of the tra trails uh, to talk about, uh, uh, the access for uh, seniors and um, handicapped people. And, you know, all these issues keep coming up, and yet there's really not a discussion of it. Um, I think, you know, it looks like the main topic tonight is uh, increase in pay, and uh, well, uh, I'll address that later, but um, certainly I think there could be a much more rigorous uh, coverage of uh, the business of Marinwood. I certainly hope it's not being done on an informal basis, i.e. not in a public forum. So um, anyhow, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stephen. Um, okay, so we will then be adopting the agenda, as is with the exception of the um, items swapped F and G. And then moving on to the consent calendar. Um, I need a motion to approve the consent calendar. A motion to approve the consent calendar. Um, yeah. Second. Thank you. Um, any 
comments from the board or questions? None. Okay. Anything from the Sorry, public? sorry. It took me a second to find my unmute there. Okay. <clears throat> um, just looking at that, are we, um, obviously we're conducting this one on Zoom. It, are, are we at some point going to discuss meeting in person? I'm like, don't we have to discuss that? You're certainly welcome to discuss it. I don't know that you have to. Uh, none of the circumstances that are outlined in the resolution have changed. Okay. The, uh, that said, if you wanted to pull this item as a separate item and just vote on the other two and have a more robust discussion about that amongst the board, that's certainly an option you could make as well. Or we can add it as a standalone item for next month to be discussed. I, I was going to say, yeah, why don't, wh I would pr propose that, that we make that a separate item just because we're moving from, I think, the heart of a pandemic to the end of one to, I think, what we're calling an endemic now. And, and I'm not saying one way or the other if I want to meet in person or Zoom, but things, I think we should have a discussion. I think that makes sense, Chris. Thanks for bringing that up. I have made a note. Anything else? All right. Any comment from the public? Yeah, one second, please. Stephen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in that section. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, w w as far as remote meetings, um, you know, I kind of like them um, and just because it's a lot easier than, you know, uh, going out to the, to, uh, you know, to the community center. And I'm just wondering uh, if when we normalize that, that we could do some kind of hybrid uh, type of meeting where, you know, the some people might be online or just make it a, a, a public spot available for people who wish to, who don't have online access. Maybe they could come in and, and sit in on uh, one of the conference rooms or something like that. Um, I did have a question on the, the consent calendar. I noticed there's a, uh, looks like $700 for uh, some summer entertainment or camp entertainment. I'm not sure if that's the, for the summer or some other period of, of time, but uh, I'm just wondering if we can have a little bit of information on it. It seems to be a lot of money for entertainment and, you know, maybe it's all worth it, but just curious what that expense is. That's all I ha It's So it's a question and hopefully I'll get a response. Thank you, Stephen. Um, any other public comment? Uh, nope, that is it. All right, so then um, there was the line item. I'm looking for it here around summer entertainment. Can anybody? I think it's 6169. It just says community event expenses for 750 to 28. I assumed it had to do with the various events that we're going, we are putting on the raise the glass and everything. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I was looking for one specific to summer, but I don't see. Oh, why I, I, I see. Yeah. 61, 69. I don't 750. Yeah. That was specific towards expenses for the raise the glass. Okay. I believe. Um, yeah. That, that would, that number sounds right. Is there one? I'm looking for one that said summer. I didn't say any. I didn't see anything that said summer. Hold on. Street lights. Okay. Well, I hope. Camp advertising camp. Oh wait, spring summer review from Wesco Graphics. No, that's that is the printing of the uh, of the program catalog that goes out every year. Okay. 
that's more than 700. Yeah, that's about, yeah. I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a large one. So, I'm, just, uh, the other one was, I'm, uh, I'm looking for summer on yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was expenses involved uh, with purchases that need to be made for the wine event. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. All right. With that, can we um, call to vote for the consent calendar? Sure. Board President Ruggieri. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And now um, moving on to public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. Do you have any public comment for open yeah, items? Yeah, one second, please. Uh, so Lisa, you can, if you, you're having trouble understanding uh, what I mean, uh, you can call back on me. I had my hand raised. Uh, it's 61-1-2 and 61-1-3, um, Schultz Entertainment, it says Camp Entertainment, at 337.50 each. Um, I don't know. It's it says summer. I don't know if it's for next summer or this, uh, the summer coming or last summer. Um, so that's that's what I was asking about. But uh, certainly, you know, we can have a dialogue here. Uh, I realize uh, that some people uh, may not like having a dialogue, but it's really kind of helpful uh, with communication if we do. Um, so uh, let's just set that aside and hopefully. Uh, you will uh, revisit uh, my last question. Um, so, as far as the opening comments are concerned, um, you know, w when they were digging around for uh, uh, the Indian mounds in this area um, and all through uh, all along Miller Creek and all on Miller Creek School, it's there was a, actually a village here, and uh, they found a lot of bones, a lot of uh, pottery and, and arrowheads and all kinds of stuff. Um, but one thing that they didn't find is what these people were thinking, what their motivations were. The only thing that really survived them was their physical culture, the, the work that they put forth in their their community and uh, other than that we you know we're just lost uh, uh, to piece it together and I uh, bring this up because your work tonight it doesn't you know the thoughts running through your head the conversations we're having this is all going to be forgotten the only thing that makes a difference is what we do to uh, improve our parks, improve our communities. And I urge you again uh, tonight to do big things and think big thoughts and think how we can grow our, our community better. And um, also to, once you've kind of established that vision, hold our staff accountable to achieving the, that vision. That's basically, you know, the role of, of local government and um, you as elected or appointed people. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Lisa, if you don't mind, if I could just circle back really quickly, I will say now that I, I see what he's looking at, I was just looking for the wrong number. Um, we, this is certainly the time of year where we do book in advance a lot of the, uh, you know, I would just call them special guests or enrichment people that come out. We have people that come out that do, you know, bring petting farms or they're setting up and paying in advance for field trips or they're setting up paying advance for other presenters that come into the camp programs. So you're going to see more of those uh, appearing as a, uh, as we get closer to summer, just so that way we can solidify and book them in advance and know that we have them for the dates we want them. Sounds great. Thank you, Eric. Thank Appreciate you. Sorry. That. Yep. Um, for clearing up that mystery for us. Appreciate it. Um, any other public comment? 
No. Okay, so then that moves us on to district matters. Item one, first draft district operating budget for FY 2022-2023. Uh, yeah, so um, I, you know, I kind of tried to put it right in the very first couple lines, and I just want to make very clear that uh, this is just really the very early stages of putting the budget together. It always is this time of year, um, but we practice, and I think it's a good practice and a transparent practice that once we start putting it together, it, it's presented to the board at each meeting leading up until final adoption. Um, this particular budget, where it stands now, it is certainly in line with where we are typically at this point in time in the process, um, but it is going to change dramatically. The other thing uh, that I want to, or not dramatically, but significantly, the other thing I want to point out is uh, I do include just kind of more for a reference point, the uh, actual numbers for this fiscal year through February 28th. They haven't been fully vetted and journaled. Um, some of those numbers may change, just be reappointed to different accounts, um, things along those lines. They won't necessarily go up or down, but they will um, some of them aren't necessarily um, uh, might need to go into a different budget line or other things like that. So that's just part of the regular uh, journaling and uh, review process, uh, auditing process for each quarter. Um, you can see I kind of gave you, you know, some of the things that are still outstanding. The ad valorem property taxes obviously is a big one needs to be uh, projected and updated. Um, the bulk of all recreation camps, programs, classes, special events, um, facility rentals, all, uh, we actually have a meeting scheduled for next week with the, myself and the rec department um, staff. So that'll be updated at that time as they're finalizing what that looks like. Um, and then our uh, service uh, contracts on the fire side with both CSA 13 and County Farm. I do have a note in there later, uh, but those are kind of placeholders that uh, don't get final finalized until actually after the end of the fiscal year, because there's a reconciliation process involved uh, that carries over year over year with how those contracts are formed. Uh, um, on the expenditure side, obviously, especially on the rec, part-time and seasonal staff wages will be updated. Uh, the rec program contractors, I'm still waiting for final information from insurances. Um, I'll need to go through and kind of analyze all of the utilities, where we're at on that, our various countywide fees, things like our LAFCO uh, uh, dues, um, various uh, dues associated with the fire department, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of that will be coming, uh, a majority of that mostly by next month, but uh, we still got a while to go. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to explain is, you know, even though we're starting to come back to what is, you know, kind of quote unquote, no more normal operations, it still makes it very tough from a budgeting perspective when you're trying to look at things from a year to year perspective, especially on the recreation department side, not as much on the fire side, but when you're looking at, well, how come these numbers are so different than the prior year? It's because, you know, we served a fraction of the kids uh, and a, had a fraction of the staff. So you just see much wider variations than you would typically see from year to year. Uh, again, this will be on every single uh, board report or board packet and board agenda uh, with a planned adoption date for May 10th, which is the typical May uh, thing. So it'll be another draft next month that I think will be much closer to final and then a final draft on May 10th that I don't anticipate will have huge fluctuations between those two drafts as it will from this draft. Um, things that have been that you can uh, see all of the full-time staffing wages and the staff really, uh, related costs um, you know, uh, uh, from a wage perspective have been updated to the current census models. This includes pensions, medical benefits, um, things along those lines. It also includes the most recent wages for the fire department personnel that were agreed upon when the board adopted uh, the MOU. Uh, I did want to point out that it makes it seem that happened after the adoption of the last budget. So when you look at like what it looks like in the increase just in the fire salaries, uh, you're actually looking at two years worth of wage increases that are in there because the numbers for 21-22, uh, this current budget were approved before the MOU, but we never went through a formal budget amendment process to change that, which is fine. Um, it's not something that's required or even needed to do. Um, other things of note, uh, district-wide, our workers' comp is going to get a little bit more expensive, mostly because our experience modification factor 
is going up from 140 to 165 uh, percent. However, this budget does continue uh, the work that the board has committed to in that um, addressing our OPEB uh, liabilities by continuing to contribute to, uh, to our OPEB trust fund as well as our uh, capital reserves and board uh, designated uh, reserves remain each at a hundred thousand um, for the year anticipated. So hopefully that'll be able to continue going. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, otherwise, the other you know kind of big piece in this on the park department is I did incorporate the, the fees you know the, the payment schedule, the amortization schedule for the financing that was taken out for the maintenance facility. So that is shown within the park department under long-term debt and long-term interest. Um, that number, when you combine them, will stay consistent for the next 10 years unless the district pays off early after year five. Uh, the only fluctuations you will see is uh, with each year, the principal amount stated will go up a little bit while the interest amount stated will go down a little bit, which is very uh, typical in how long-term debt works. Um, otherwise, uh, you can kind of see the rest of the notes. I'm happy to field any questions. Uh, just realizing this is nothing more than the very first, very preliminary draft. It's gonna have a lot of changes um, between now and the April meeting. The April meeting is going to give us a much better picture at the overall, um, but it, it, this is where we typically are, and I do think that it uh, is certainly helpful to, to view and ask any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Um, any any questions or comment from the board? Go ahead, Savan. I just had kind of a quick question. Um, in looking at the various numbers that we have budgeted, budgeted, there's that word. Um, I know that we're going to have an increase in rentals for the outdoor picnic areas and the pool. And there had been a discussion actually right before COVID about how we were renting out the actual facility and to what events. And I'm wondering if that discussion is starting up again now that people are starting to possibly want to do indoor rentals? Uh, this isn't something that we've discussed in great detail yet. Um, we haven't opened up indoor rentals yet. Okay. Um, that said, it'll be something that, you know, Luke and I uh, will certainly discuss when we get together and look at kind of the rest of the park and the rec offerings and the budget okay. and the expenditure. So um, we'll have a better update for you for that, I would say, at the next meeting. Um, you know, and just kind of, it, it just gets tricky on that because people book out very far in advance on those right. things. Public health situations can change and it's very hard to go back to somebody who's planning an event at our place to now say, you can't do that anymore. Um, yeah. It involves refunds. It, it's a hardship on them. So, you know, there's a lot of consideration factors that do go into it, not just where are we currently, but we got to think of uh, where could we be down the line and uh, it doesn't represent a huge amount of revenue on that. Okay. On yeah. That I was just looking at the various numbers and trying Understood. to wrap my head around that and the um, discussions that we were going to be having about uh, wage increases. So I just kind of wanted to know if that was going to be money that we were going to start having coming in again or not. Okay. Sure. Understood. I have one question. Um, I believe that at a previous meeting, it was, it was discussed that we would have pool memberships again this year. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there's no line item for that. Yeah, we just haven't, again, that all kind of falls under all of the rec program, pool operations. Uh, we haven't sat down and had that meeting yet. So none of that has been updated yet. But yes, we okay. are selling pool memberships. And yes, okay. uh, we will uh, uh, estimate out, uh, you know, kind of based on historicals and where we are and what we anticipate uh, a number there, uh, most likely a conservative number. I expect it to be conservative. It's your, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure I was kind of questioning my memory too. No, no, no. We are pool, uh, <laughs> pool memberships are currently for sale and they will certainly be reflected in the budget. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. And then we're going to be starting camp. So that will like super increase the number of pool memberships. Are we doing the thing where if you buy your pool membership, you can register for camp early again? No, no, but it, you do get a discount. Okay. I just was wondering if like for people who were not in or in, what if we're doing that for them again? No. Any other questions from the board comments? 
Um, how about from the public? Uh, yep, one second, please. Yeah. So uh, I, I would like to make some comments about the budget, but I want to make sure I understand it first. The actuals column as of 228, is that from uh, July 1st through uh, February 28th or what? Correct. Okay. So one observation that I, I made, I'm making is, you know, the budgets and the, the actuals, there's a huge gap a huge gap and you know I'm not quite sure why they why there's such a uh, a gap of expenditure at, of actuals from the budget but uh, that's a little concerning because you know the budget is where we establish our priorities and so if we're not spending like we had anticipated, then we need to adjust the budget appropriately, and it doesn't look like you're doing that. I, I understand it's been a weird year as far as revenue goes due to COVID, but uh, uh, maybe you can discuss that a little bit more. Um, um, okay, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the only thing I would say is the budget, uh, should reflect the priorities of the board and if you haven't thought what those priorities are uh, it's not to you know put a gold star on on our staff's forehead each month uh, but but actually measure them against uh, the goals that we've set out as a district and I I don't think we've really fully articulated that so the discussion of the budget really needs to reflect that and we need realistic budget budgeting numbers. Um, so hopefully it'll get a little uh, closer to reality the next time we look at it. Um, the as far as the rentals of uh, the facility, um, I don't know. I, I, I see kind of un, under activity in that area. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interest, but I think we could do a better job of marketing. Um, I know there's concern about public safety, and I don't think we figured that portion out. Um, I'm really concerned with the amount of alcohol that we serve uh, uh, in the in the community, in the, uh, both inside and outside, and uh, I think that's part of the problem uh, with uh, you know some of the uh, uh, public safety issues that we've had to deal with. Um, but I hopefully, you know, people are still getting married and girls are still having quinceaneras and uh, uh, we really should make our uh, facilities available uh, to the public. Thank you, Stephen. Any other public comment? No, that was all. Thank you. Okay. And moving on to item two, pay schedule wage adjustments for non-represented positions. Uh, sure, I can uh, get this started. Obviously, um, you know, the packet here includes a very detailed uh, staff report that was put together for this. I'm certainly not gonna go through and read it uh, word for word or line by line, but I, I, one of the things I do wanna explain right off the top is uh, at this point in time, this is not a formal action item that I'm not, you're not looking for a motion and a second and a vote from the board. Um, this is an informative item with some staff recommendations that will coincide with uh, the budget approval process and then ultimately with the approval that happens in June every year of the public pay schedules. Um, so those are the two action parts that will occur in May and in June. Um, and that would be the timing. Um, however, this is a good time to talk about it, and it's certainly a good time to put it out there, and it's a transparent way to discuss um, what, in my opinion, is a bit of an imminent need. Um, and there is two factors here at play. The first factor is looking at uh, what are some recommended immediate adjustments that will be incorporated into the draft budget, and ultimately, if the budget supports it, uh, incorporated into the final budget that gets approved. Um, 
and then the second aspect of this is the need um, to look at and develop and an, a regular practice of reviewing these items. Um, for context, you know, I've only been here for a little over seven years now. Um, when I came in was kind of, you know, towards the tail end of what was a, a more financially challenging time for the district. The district had just got done making some really tough decisions, some of which were explained in this packet and, you know, eliminating positions and outsourcing certain things. Uh, and for a year or two, my understanding is was actually spending more than they were bringing in in any given year. Um, we are not necessarily in that position anymore. We've found ourselves in a much more financially stable and consistent position. Uh, monies that we have in the bank, monies that we have set aside towards reserves, towards long-term liabilities is much stronger, uh, especially considering that we had none um, prior to, you know, kind of some of the actions that have been taken over the last few years. Um, we've made significant gains on our cash holdings, um, so forth. Unfortunately, as we've done that, uh, looking at what our pay schedules are for the positions that we do have, which, you know, quite honestly, are pretty limited considering the scope of output that comes out of this agency has, has been neglected. So, uh, you know, those are the two conversations um, that are somewhat different. One is looking at we, what we have presented here. And then the other is how is this going to be addressed in a, a more regular manner year over year or even every other year? Um, but I, I think is equally as important as, as what we're looking to do right now. And, and I think that would help me to know that what I can uh, put together and in, uh, information for the board, I think it'll help staff to know that, okay, there is, you know, some level of a wage process. It doesn't mean that every year wages are going to get increased. It means we're going to look at the district's ability to afford other economic factors that are at play and come up with the process by which to measure against as this gets reviewed on a, uh, regular basis, um, whatever that may be, either annually or biannually is what I would recommend. Um, as far as the task at hand here, uh, looking at what is immediately put in front of you, I've tried to give you um, a lot of uh, information and data, uh, you know, one being, you know, just a history of kind of the recent increases for the positions that are listed. Um, also, uh, you know, kind of some broad strokes on what those position responsibilities are, and then looking at current uh, current pay schedules for those and recommended pay schedules for those. Uh, it should be pointed out that especially on our rec side, you know, as staff, and I, I certainly want to thank Luke because he put a lot of time and him and his staff did in kind of looking at some comparables um, based on my request and asking him to do that. Um, you know, park side and on the maintenance side is a little bit more cut and dried on the recreation side. You know, one of the big findings is it's really a lot more, uh, I don't want to say convoluted, but it, it's not as easy. It's not an apples to apples comparison as I wrote in there. Um, you know, staff do different things. Titles mean different things at different places. What we call a rec supervisor might be a rec coordinator in a different position or vice versa. Um, uh, you know, especially looking at Luke's position, um, I don't know of many other agencies that have somebody who's serving as the, uh, uh, you know, at a director level for two entirely different de departments being both, you know, our recreation department and our parks maintenance department. Um, so for that reason, you know, we chose to omit the uh, comparables because it just seemed to lead to more confusion than it did any levels of clarification. Uh, what I can say is as we were looking at things and trying to dig into them, you know, it was consistent with all of the positions that we have at this agency, all of which, you know, fall at um, or near the bottom of all other respective agencies that, you know, are locally found that serve the same types of functions. Um, hence the need to review and potentially go up with that. Um, so right now, what I'm hoping for the board is, you know, some level of discussion on what was presented here, uh, some level of discussion on what would seem to make sense for a regular uh, practice of reviewing these moving forward, and then ultimately some level of, you know, consensus amongst that discussion that will allow me to take some of these numbers um, and put them into future budget drafts. So you can start to see how exactly that's gonna play out within you know, this budget in particular. It's hard to play it out year over year because there are variable factors that come into play, uh, certain things that change that are directly tied to wages, such like uh, pension um, 
contribution rates, uh, workers' comp rates, uh, and uh, you know taxes, things along those lines. So that's where we're at. I, um, again, it's a lengthy report. I appreciate everybody's time and reading it thoroughly. I hope, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or clarify, or uh, you know, and, and primarily listen as well to the board's thoughts and discussion on this. Thanks, Eric. Um, so, opening it up to the board. <laughs> Any. It's about, um, it's about so, I mean, there, yeah, there's two different components that we're looking at here. Um, I guess first, what we can, what I'm going to suggest we do is, you know, look specifically at the recommendations that have been made as far as the um, adjustments for for this next year. Um, and then, of course, looking at kind of a go forward basis, how it would make sense to review compensation for these groups to make sure that we're doing it regularly. I'll start. Um, thank you immensely for putting the this together with all the details not you know of what they do and what they handle and i just want to let you and your staff know that we appreciate every little big task that you guys do you guys are small and mighty so it is definitely noticed um i like the 10 percent i'm just gonna i'm just gonna jump in um I like the 10%. I will agree with Bill that it is due and past due. Um, I also think the consideration is if we lost any one of them or that position, what would it cost us to hire somebody and not only just hire, but train and try to get them up to speed and try to, you know, and then not lose them from them being overwhelmed with the small but mighty task that they will have to endure. So I want to make sure that we are also competitive within this market to retain who we have. Um, so that's kind of where I'm also looking at this as my position of moving forward. Um, and then do you want my two do you want to discuss this and then discuss annually versus or timing afterwards okay yeah, yeah. i'll do it separate yeah. yeah so so thank you um mm -hmm. director kilkenny for the recommendation um i guess i mean go ahead i don't really have much more to say because <laughs> i just second that mm -hmm. i think we all know that we have an amazing group of people working for us and that they do above and beyond what could be expected out of people, especially with some of the facilities that we've been expecting them to work out of. Um, having come on the board earlier than some of the other people, I knew that it wasn't in our budget previously. And now that we're more financially stable and have some wiggle room, I really think that the 10% seems totally reasonable to adjust for this year. And I'm happy to discuss how we can make this um, moving forward. Just as Kathleen said, we can't afford to lose anybody. And um, not just financially, but the years of experience and knowledge that everybody has about the district and the inner workings would be um, a great loss and felt across the board so i i agree i would jump right on board with the uh, staff recommendations um, i mean i look at those wages and i always compare it to kind of you know like the whole teacher process that we go through um i mean these these probably are are barely living wages in marin and it's not getting any cheaper that's for sure so i would totally promote the staff project or the staff recommendations. Yeah. Director Shea. Uh, what, what can I possibly add to that other than I've been on trying to get this going for the last few months. So yeah, we started talking about this last year uh, going forward. Um, yes, 
I wholeheartedly agree with the uh, staff recommendations. Thank you, and I, I agree with them as, as well for so many different reasons. And again, Eric, thank you so much for laying all of this out just so clearly so that we could see not only, you know, what the, what the bottom line number would be um, for these increases and then just looking at what they are. Um, I think about just um, attrition um, and just how tight the labor market is. I mean, right now it's um, it's tighter than it was before the pandemic. I'll just tell you that much. And um, and turnover is very costly, and recruiting is very costly, and um, we don't want to see anybody go. So um, and and they and these people do a lot for us and their roles have certainly um they've gone in a, a number of, of different directions and taken on a lot a lot more than what they originally signed up for so i am in full support of staff recommendations um and then sort of moving on to um what you know kind of a go forward um for lack of a better way of putting it review process of just looking at um review of, of, of compensations and where we can make adjustments. Um, I'd be interested in knowing, and I, I'm going to open this up, but from my perspective, it would be, I think it would be helpful to know what other districts are doing and, you know, how often they're conducting these types of reviews. Um, and that can maybe give us some more guidance as to whether it's um, annually every other year um how you know and and as well as who sort of who sort of does them is it something that there's a subcommittee for or outsourced um a lot of other details so i'd, I'd be interested to know and i think we have some time um kind of a, some comparables that's my piece on that part if anyone else would like to share their thoughts uh, that makes a lot of sense uh... I'm not sure whether looking at it annually would do a whole lot of good because of the way things move. They can move slowly. So biannually seemed to be, to me, a more logical way of doing it. Uh, but never having done this before, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm not in the job market or, you know, we, I haven't hired somebody in God knows how long. Um, yeah, I, I think biannually. I, I just think annually is just too often to go through a process like that when there's other things. Well, if you had something in place where if you got a certain review, you would get X bump then you, it wouldn't have to be an annual thing that's so complicated, but like a larger raise. Well, I'm gonna, can, I, can I interject wait, wait, wait. for a second, please? Um, I just want to play a, a couple of thoughts that have been coming is in looking at this and what these kind of pay schedule wages are. Um, and, you know, my mindset going into this and Believe me, I, I respect and appreciate the people who are currently working for us uh, as much, if not more than anybody, is uh, this is about the positions uh, and the positions that we need, not necessarily about the people that are in them. Um, and there is a vast difference between how you know, salaries and increases are looked at in a private sector versus a public sector. And in a private sector, a lot of times they are tied to reviews, which is a very objective measure. And I would strongly recommend staying far away from objective measures and looking at these positions and the tasks that are needed from these positions in comparison to market rates of what the positions have. Um, that's just my two cents. And I reiterate that that is in no way, shape or form uh, my reflection of how much I value the people that are currently in the roles. Um, but in a public agency, and any public agency attorney will tell you this, if you start tying things together with, you know, performance reviews or anything like that, you're, you're really getting into a, 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 a tricky area. It, it, closes off, uh, it closes off transparency to large degrees. It makes this very 
uh, transparent when it is, you know, these are what, you know, and that's a lot of the reason why they have the step systems in place that kind of guide you through those first several years as well. Um, so I, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, um, but I think in a public sector, that is not a standard way of doing business. And it's uh, actually uh, kind of recommended against, um, unfortunately. So are you... Can okay. I ask my question really quick? Yeah. I haven't taken my HR module yet, um, but I can you confirm that we wouldn't even see the review. We wouldn't. We don't yes. manage our staff. These aren't. These aren't. These aren't, these aren't merit based increases. These are not yeah. merit based. So that's that's the great. That's the right term. Lisa. And isn't so a right. we would be when I say review, we would be reviewing what the numbers look like. And if if we can increase them, and if so, by how much? And that would be the review part. Correct. Correct. So, I got that from your comment, Savans. I felt like it was more on a personal. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize. And, and Eric clarified that that's not how yeah. we're going to do it. Yeah, I didn't realize I've always worked for private companies right. or universities that did not have this step system in place. So. Right. Okay, so quick question. So we've all agreed definitely with main, with the park maintenance that we're agreeing with the 10%, and now we're discussing how to move forward yearly, or did we agree for both the recreation and the maintenance that we will go with the recommended increase of 10% for park and rec, and I believe it was... Five. Uh, it varies on some of them. One of the ones that is actually a little bit trickier, and I kind of meant to touch on this, and I unfortunately forgot about it, is in looking at the uh, at the assistant recreation director position as well okay. as the recreation supervisor position. Um, what I'm suggesting here is slightly different, so I'm going to just go ahead and start with the recreation supervisor position. And Lisa, I know this okay. is getting us a little off topic in terms of looking at what's the process going forward. Um, and I do have thoughts on that as well. Um, but in terms of the recreation supervisor, this position has actually gone up uh, recently. However, as recently as last year, and again, uh, uh, that was done wholly in part because it was no longer in compliance with the um, exempt salary thresholds as set forth by the um, Department of Labor. Uh, so uh, that, that's in regards to FLSA. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act says that for people to be considered exempt, they have to meet not only specific work duties, but also a very specific salary threshold. Um, the recreation supervisor position as we have it absolutely needs to be an exempt position. And that's why that was moved up. When we did that, however, um, you know, steps D through double E or, you know, four, five, and six um, did not follow the traditional 5% step model. Those were reduced at the time because it was a larger increase. If you look at, say, you know, from step two to step three, that's actually more than a 5%. So step four, five, and six were brought down. What I would, um, at some point, we're still going to need to re-review where we're at on step one and step two because you couldn't bring in somebody at that wage and have them be FLSA exempt. Um, but that's not what I'm proposing at this moment in time. Um, but what I am proposing is for step four, five, and six, we actually fall back in line with the 5% um, increase for that. Uh, um, the reason there's not a cost impact associated with that is because the current person in that position would be uh, essentially is at step three for the vast majority of the next fiscal year. Um, so that keeps them at that exempt level. And that's just the way that the timing is working out. If for some reason that position became vacant and we had to refill it, uh, that would be a conversation Luke and I would have based on who uh, we were able to recruit and find that uh, they might have to come in at step two, depending on experience levels. And they would be strictly a 40 hour employee um, paid hourly, looking at uh, a non-exempt or uh, at a non-exempt status, um, or ideally somebody with enough experience that we can bring them in at step three to immediately put them into exempt status. Uh, the bottom line is during the pool season, uh, there are days and weeks where a 40-hour work week is uh, far exceeded, and we just uh, you, you 
uh, if you do that with somebody who doesn't qualify for exemption, then you're paying them overtime for every hour over eight in a day or 40 in a work week. Um, so that gets a little tricky. The, rec uh, the assistant recreation director, um, that position was created in 2018 and we actually, it was formerly a, a recreation supervisor. However, in recognition that of the way that the tasks were divvied up, um, we certainly recognized that one of them seemed to you know, have a much larger workload, much larger responsibilities, tasked with all of the camps, the year round youth programs, um, so on and so forth. We actually added a little bit more responsibility to that position. When that was originally done, that was set at a mark that was 15% higher than the recreation supervisor position. Uh, I'm not suggesting that at this um, stage, the recreation supervisor position also went up quite a bit with the ex exemption threshold set by the, um, through FLSA. Um, that said, I am, you know, looking at, okay, how do we get back? Because it, it, when we moved those, they became very close to even if you actually look at uh, where they fell. Um, so I, I'm placing that at, you know, with one level being a 5% above recreation supervisor and another level being at about 10%, not about at 10% above the recreation supervisor. Uh, one would have a burden impact of just under 5,000 for this fiscal year. The other would have a burden impact of around 9,000. But if you also see my recommendation, it still is moving it to that 10%. It's just, do you do that over the course of two fiscal years or you do that um, all within this upcoming fiscal year? And would that, the person who's in the assistant recreation direct, that would impact us directly because they're in, okay, never mind. Sorry. Because their, their current step would go yeah. up. There's no change to the current step uh, of the recreation supervisor position that they are currently in. So that's why okay. there's, that's a nominal impact. Okay. When I know we, it's a lot of info, so I apologize. Well, for that. The reason I had asked what I asked was basically saying, okay, we're all basically agreeing that everybody needs their raises and we're agreeing with the recommendations that you're giving us for what they need to be made whole. But then with what we're saying that what we're currently starting off as with all of our positions as our step ones, we couldn't hire anybody. So I'm putting this out there. It may be completely wrong. Shoot me down. But what if we just kind of moved everything over? And so that well, I, I think in essentially that's what we've done. Like, so if we raise the entire pay schedule by 5%, what you're actually doing is taking everything and moving it right. backwards it, it, a step the and then adding yeah. another step so, that's 5% at the end. So this, I just want to make sure that then our step one, when we're hiring people in, that that would be, we would be able to hire people at each of these positions with that amount of money. But that's uh, what, can I just, I've got to catch up here for a minute. Okay. We are approving all the, like the increase for all the steps, correct? I You're believe not, so. We're not approving anything. We're discussing yeah. it. We've all agreed. We're not. Correct. But, hold on. Let me ask my, yeah. wait, I got to catch up. Let me ask my questions. When we discuss this, we are discussing increasing all the steps. And then what you just said, Eric, is that based on someone's skill, they can come in in step number two or step number three, if you choose to have them come in at that level, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just, I wanted to make sure that I'm just following what, right. a lot of information here. <laughs> yeah. All of the steps would be, would be increased by what would, the, the, the numbers that we're discussing by the percentages we're discussing. And then in the future, people can be hired into any of the steps at that new amount. And I'm right. just, so, yeah, I just want to confirm that we could actually get people if we needed to, because we do have open positions right now that we haven't been able to fill. Uh, we have one open position and that's one that is being addressed actually with the largest increase. That's only on the park side. We don't have any open positions that are listed here on the recreation. Side. Okay. But I just want to make sure that with all of the positions by doing these increases, we will be able to hire people in. It's not that we're going to also need to then address that again when well, we, we try I, to hire. Is it, I, is it enough? Uh, is that the question? Is, yes. it, is it enough? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, 
it, it, to be bluntly honest with you, I mean, it's these are still we're amongst the lower of the pay schedules for comparable positions. Um, that said, not everything is always about pay. Um, and is it enough is, you know, a bit of a rhetorical question that is tough for us to be able to answer until we actually would have to go through that process. And then uh, this is also a piece that supports us then going back and looking at these numbers every so often to see if they're in line with what the market is telling us they need to be. Correct. Okay. Okay. Correct. Yep. That's a good way to put it. Um, so I guess then kind of, you know, moving on to, you know, back to where we were as far as, I mean, unless, do we want to go into the numbers anymore or can we move on to kind of the move to go forward on review? I think the only thing for me that I would be looking for, you know, kind of that further direction in terms of the actual numbers is like I said, I, I've given you kind of two different options for one of the positions. Um, in terms of how to get it up to where staff recommends it should be and whether that uh, happens within one year or two years. I, I would personally recommend in looking at what the final numbers came out to be, it's only a difference of about $4,000. I would, I would incorporate that into next year's budget, all of it, rather than looking at this from a two-step process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just simply for the assistant recreation director position, which certainly is a, a heightened level position that um, it is being compared to in this, in, for this purpose. Yeah. I, I vote for one year. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, but we're not voting, I, but we're not voting, but like I, I say that we request that Eric build it into the one year budget, not two year budget for this. That one. Thank you. Correct. I liked Lisa's suggestion on seeing how other agencies review. Um, but for these numbers for this budget, I would like. Oh, I, I would prefer and like to see the max increase that the recommendations are coming across for each position. And then in this year's budget, um, and just hit us hard, <laughs> basically. And then I would also like, I do like your suggestion of what agencies are reviewing. Um, but I kind of, go, I mean, originally, my thought was every three years, because I really don't revisit this every single year. But I like Bill's suggestion of biannually. I think it's nice to give the staffs the idea of, okay, for the next two years, this is my income. For the next, you know, like you have a little bit of a security. So that's just kind of where I'm coming from. So I like the biannual as well. So. Okay. Um, Go ahead. The one thing I would say, I mean, there are certainly other avenues besides just our local folks. I mean, through CSDA, um, you know, we uh, there is what's known as a listserv uh, board that I can certainly pose the question out to, um, you know, ultimately what's a couple hundred different agencies across the state in terms of how do you, um, you know, what is the process procedures and timings in regards to reviewing uh, pay schedule adjustments. Uh, and then, you know, as it was mentioned earlier, um, we actually do have two board members that are participating in the uh, Special District Leadership Academy with several other districts and representatives right now. And there will be an HR and a finance component that is coming up in those. And I think it would be a good question to pose to those groups that they are interacting with and get some other ideas from that perspective on, hey, is this something, does your agency have a regular timing by which these are reviewed and what are the factors that they are reviewed against? There we go, this oh, is great timing. Yeah, definitely we'll be asking questions so we're waiting till we have more than one module before we bring you the right. list of things that no, we No, no, but do. I don't mean a question of me. I mean, a qu ask that amongst yeah. the other participants that you are doing this program with. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've yeah. been, we've been mm -hmm. discussing things as a group. It was, it's yeah. been a really good, yeah. I and suggest. You know, right. And, and on something like that, I think it's good to get, you know, I, I, for timing on that, I would say this is something to bring back, you know, at the beginning of the next fiscal year, once we kind of get through budget, get through the end of this fiscal year. Um, it gives us something that could be discussed, you know, August, September timeframe, um, which gives us more than enough time, you know, just the process itself. And then we can apply that process um, and refine that process as we move forward and, and actually review this in a couple of years. So it gives us plenty of time to pull this info, query, uh, you know, well beyond just our usual kind of local partners um, and, 
other agencies do this. There's not a reason to reinvent the wheel. It's to, you know, kind of take the best practices from other agencies and modify it to fit the needs of this district. So. Like that. And I, I appreciate kind of the, 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 the perspective on, on timing to, to do this. And I mean, it gives us, that gives us ample, I think, time to do some diligence around it and come to the table with recommendations for go forward. Um, all right, well, anything else from the board on pay schedule wage adjustments? Uh, I just think it's like, it seems like we have our consensus on the actual adjustments. I mean, I know we have to finalize it formally, but um, I, I really think it's smart for us to go out and get as much information as possible. I like the direction we're headed here. It's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that I am clear, um, and obviously still need to go to public comment, but right now it seems like it's a consensus amongst the board to incorporate um, the models that equal the $39,740 impact to this budget um, as laid out in the conclusion paragraph at the end. And then we're gonna research and bring back sometime shortly into the beginning of the new fiscal year, um, potential uh, processes by which uh, a more formal review can take place on a regular basis. Correct. Great. Thank you. All right. Any public comment? Uh, yes. One second. Steve. Uh, thanks for this great uh, report, Eric. And I agree with you that um, one of the things you need to be careful with, with making these comparisons with all these other agencies, is it, it's really not an apples to apples comparison. Marinwood is a small agency, limited in scope and responsibility, um, and our staff wear more hats, I think, than than uh, other all of these other uh, of, uh, municipalities. Um, having said that, I do agree that uh, we need to pay our staff competitive wages always, um, and. Uh, I am a little bit troubled by the notion that uh, we can't have merit reviews. Um, I have always been in the private sector. That's the only way I've, I've been judged is by what I, I uh, do for my employer. And um, uh, so this idea that you would simply move people along uh, by virtue of just, you know, having the job for a long time, just seems like a demotivation uh, for the employees. I do believe that good employees save money, can make you money. Um, I, I, I really do believe in, in excellence, but I also believe in measuring that excellence against uh, some kind of criteria. I, I don't know how, how you know, f from the staff standpoint, you know, how do they set, how do they evaluate themselves? How well are they doing? Um, so I do have a couple questions. Um, are the staff earning any money from uh, CSD activities, uh, you know, outside normal business? For example, you know, the wine event we had. Um, I do believe that we started doing these uh, many years ago during the budget shortfalls as a way to give additional uh, money to our staff. And um, is that money being accounted for in these pay schedules? So that's, that, that I think is an important question because I don't think, I think um, we need to be, start looking at some of our revenue ge generating um, activities as businesses, as profit and loss uh, events. And it doesn't mean we can't sustain a loss if we want to do something, but at least we have the ability to understand what we're uh, investing in. Um, I, I think uh, the, we have expanded our, our staff uh, uh, quite a bit, and uh, more people are uh, in the office and you know the same or maybe a little less work is 
being uh, completed out in the field now uh, because of COVID and other events. And so I would also like a review uh, before uh, agreeing to this, which I do think we need to do increases, uh, especially in this inflationary environment. Um, but before we do that, I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, are we uh, properly structured or, or, or is our staff doing stuff that uh, needs to be done in-house? Can we outsource some of these things? One of the I thoughts was, you know, we do the, the review all the time. That costs a lot of money. There's a, there's a staff member devoted to that. Maybe that should be outsourced. I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. But, but those are the kinds of things I would, would ask. And um, I think in general, I think you have to ask yourself, We've we we've up we we've upped our staff staffing level. Do we really need the level of staffing uh, on a year time basis uh, that we currently have? Um, the reason I would like to do this is I'm sorry. It's been three minutes, and I, I believe I believe that we gave you three minutes, Stephen. Thank you. You've, you've been speaking for five minutes, just so you know. We're going to, we're going to have to meet you. Thank you, Stephen. Three minutes is all you get. Ah, fuck. Okay, so um, a question that I, I, I was there, I, I believe there was a question that about. There, there's a couple things in there that I can certainly address if you would like me. Thank, to, thank you, please. please. Yeah. Um, the comment, there's comment regarding staff that are earning money outside of normal business um, as a result of our special events. Um, I, I'm not, no, <laughs> uh, to answer that question. Uh, that doesn't happen. It certainly has never happened in my time, and I'm not aware of that ever happening. Staff does not earn side money uh, from special events in any way, shape, or form. Um, then um, there was a comment about expanding our staff um, and actually that is not an accurate comment either. We have not expanded our staff. The staffing has stayed the same for actually quite a while. And if anything, we've actually reduced staff um, by 40% on our park side. And within our office, it's the same staffing model that it's always been with the exception that uh, the administrative assistant position, which at one time was an hourly position, was moved into a full-time role, keeping in mind that uh, for a multifunction special district that uh, has a little over a $6 million budget, uh, um, there's all of two positions dedicated to the entire business administration of this district. So um, the, uh, otherwise, staffing positions have not been expanded and staffing has not been expanded. Um, if I would recommend anything, it would be that it should be expanded because we should um, certainly have uh, the amount of stuff that we do with the limited number of staff that we have is, is fairly remarkable. And sometimes it concerns me to some degree on staff burnout. Um, of course, expanding staff means I need a place for them to go. And as all of you have walked through this office, uh, I have no idea where I would put any of these extra staff, but they could certainly be well used. But I think right now with the model and uh, fortunately with the people that we have in place, we seem to continue to uh, not only get it done, but uh, find ways to improve and expand year after year. Thanks, Eric. Can I also add that as a board member, um, I trust our supervisors and our director to do the review. And again, we addressed that earlier, that is not the board's position to 
review and do reviews on merit. So I just want to throw that out there again. Good. Thank you, Good. Director Kilkenny. All right, can we move on to the district manager report? Sure. Uh, as you kind of look, uh, one thing you know, I, I certainly want to highlight is on the uh, the play structure replacement project. You know, uh, kind of uh, normally known as the uh, playground project, but it really is just focused on the play structures and replacing those. Um, Chris case as a representative from Kelly's Wishes contacted me a while back uh, and informed me of, uh, you know, one thing that was uh, very exciting and one thing that was um, saddening but very well understood is that uh, the Kelly's Wishes Foundation, uh, which is a foundation that his family had established uh, when his uh, a family member, also Chris's sister, passed away, uh, you know, fairly tragically at much too young of an age. Um, was going to be dissolving and that they were looking and would like to make their final donation towards this uh, play structure replacement project, which I just is, is incredibly humbling. This foundation has done a lot of um, amazing things, um, you know, not only just for local charitable causes, but other causes that spread just, you know, beyond the, the walls of Marinwood, I would say as well. Um, so, um, you know, in working in, with Chris and his family and talking to them, the time was right to make this uh, known publicly um, that this was happening and that they are going to uh, looking to make a, a very generous final um, donation towards this project that we get to be the honored beneficiaries of. So um, just a large thank you to the foundation, everybody involved with the foundation and, and the Case family, obviously. I, I know that the their decision to dissolve, I'm sure, was not an easy one. And the fact that uh, they were thinking about us is this, you know, final great cause. Uh, and this project in particular, um, I thought was just great. So, you know, Chris and I and any other representatives from his family or the foundation will certainly talk uh, a little bit more about what this means. Um, and I would like to at some point bring back to the board after I talk to Chris on ways that it can be, you know, properly and permanently acknowledged. Uh, yeah. I, so, I was, uh, was going to ask if we can do a plaque. We, yeah, well, let me. Or whatever I, it is. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them and see what they are most comfortable with, and we'll bring this back um, to the board at that point in time. Um, the park maintenance facility, if you haven't been near there, it is, uh, I mean, we are right there on the uh, end. Some of the things that I listed out. Uh, I can tell you the final interior doors have arrived. They are actually sitting in there um, and just uh, need to be installed. There's some minor trim work, some minor paint touch up work in terms of the building itself. And then the um, final installation of the fire alarm and monitoring system that then will need to be tested. And then this building um, will be good to go in terms of going for a certificate of occupancy. Um, that does not close the permit out, but it does create a certificate of occupancy. With that said, um, it's not quite ready to be fully moved in and become a working functional building. Um, before the end of this month, we will absolutely, in, in talking with the uh, architect, I think we're on schedule for this, get the uh, bid package and proposal out um, for the courtyards and everything that we are looking to do there. Um, but they can certainly start moving things in, at least to the conditioned, enclosed, and secured space um, once the rest of the work is there. So um, the building is really fantastic. The structural engineer was out today just to verify he has no structural concerns over it. Um, and then we'll walk through and do the punch list um, once all of the uh, final pieces are done. So that way we're noting any any of the punch lists is just little things that uh, still need to be addressed. Um, and then we will sign off on that. So um, building looks fantastic. It's gonna uh, function fantastically, I believe. And so we're all excited to finally uh, be at that point in the game. Um, nobody more so than myself, to be honest with you, because this has been one long um, detail oriented <laughs> project to say the least. It has stretched many, many years um, and efforts and it was quickly realized why agencies either have public works professionals or hire professional consultants to uh, guide this process. Um, that said, it was an interesting learning um, opportunity, um, one that I would not recommend we take on in-house again in the future. Uh, in terms may of this, one, the process and approvals, yes. May I ask one question? When we put out to the bids for the courtyards, are we potentially doing it in one big bin or are we bid or are we gonna split it up like we did the facility and the courtyards, just in case we don't 
it comes back too big and we don't do the back one. What are, I, that's a good question, sure. Kathleen, and I'm happy to uh, tell you what, uh, what our thinking is on this. So there are, there's two courtyards that um, are built, one on the west side, which is the side closest to Miller Creek Road, and one on the east side that kind of um, extends down towards the Panhandle Path. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at what you are talking about is uh, looking at a base bid that okay. will that will be the western courtyard. That is the that that is uh, provides the final layer layer of security because the western end of the building where the rolling stock and other items will go is actually open ended and not conditioned. So this will close that off with a uh, locking you know rolling gate on that end. Uh, an ad alt or an additional alternative um, will be the Eastern courtyard. They will all be bidding on all of it, but the base bid, the bid that you'll have to uh, either accept or reject all bids would be for the Western courtyard. Um, so that way, again, we're looking at, you know, what are the costs going to come in at this? And then we're also looking at some adults for various um, materials, qualities, and, uh, and building styles, you know, between, you know, steel versus wood versus types of wood and things like that. So the base bid will be the lowest and then some of these adults will work their way up. Um, so you, the board will have some options and hopefully the goal is it comes in with, uh, you know, ideally what we want is to put up both courtyards. But I do think that at a minimum, um, the Western courtyard could, could, we could make that work. Um, we couldn't, we can't really make it work without it as it currently stands, unless we just kind of come in and, uh, you know, just put up some fencing, but you know, there's grading that's needed. There's fill that's needed. There is, uh, uh other drainage thoughts that come in. Um, you know, these will be cement kind of retained because of the way the grading works. So, um, it, it really is kind of a professional level job, but we're looking to break it down into, um, as a, you know, kind of a fail safe measure, depending on what amount these bids come back at, we can always scale it back and say, let's just put in the base level at this point in time. Okay. I think that's what I was looking for. Cause I don't want to get to the point where we have to start over if we change anything. Um, nobody is. wants to not get to that yeah. point more than I do, <laughs> Kathleen. So that's why we're putting a lot of, a lot of thought into how that's going to go out and how that's okay. going to be bid upon. Um, any Thank other you. questions on that or I just kind of move on real nope. quick. Here. Um, Miller Creek trail, um, you know, certainly not due to a lack of effort. Um, they're just, I haven't had, um, uh, the opportunity to really communicate with the developer. We did have a conversation actually very shortly after the last meeting, at which point it became apparent that he didn't actually receive the report that I had sent him, uh, you know, two or three weeks prior, two weeks prior. Um, so we left it at, um, he did confirm receipt of getting that report. He's going to review that report. We're going to set a time to discuss and hopefully by next month, I have better updates for you on that. Um, so that way he can thoroughly review. Uh, and then the other one is just kind of an ad note here. Um, you know, we're still, you know, uh, putting pressure is the wrong term, but trying to have what's, you know, this kind of cell dead zone uh, address this, you know, exists kind of more in the berries, um, immediately west of the community center as well as within the community center and then moving out towards Lucas Valley Estates. Um, and again, I just really want to thank Mary Sackett, who uh, serves as the aide to uh, Supervisor Damon Connolly. She's definitely put a lot of work and made a lot of headway in identifying the proper people. Um, there is one little side note in this, you know, one of the things that AT&T expressed when we were also telling them that this was a concern for first responders during a recent incident was, um, that they do have what's known as a public private partnership with the federal government for something that's called FirstNet. Uh, and this is a dedicated network specifically for first responders operates, you know, kind of in its own, um, uh, on, a, on its own frequencies, on its own waves. I don't know if it's dedicated hardware, but it's a dedicated line for first responders. Um, doesn't solve the overall picture. And I have certainly made them aware that, you know, part of our larger concern is this larger dead zone, but it's something that Chief White and I have had a very, very brief opportunity to kind of communicate with back and forth. And uh, we'll look a little bit more into that. I don't know how applicable that really is to our small agency, but we do know some other agencies are using it. Um, so I think Chief White, who is going to try to get a little bit more info uh, from some of those other agencies on that. If it's an option, we'll bring it to the um, table down the line, but that doesn't address the larger problem um, that we're trying to have addressed of just this kind of larger dead zone that exists within here and uh, how we can make a, 
hopefully make a little headway on that as well. Uh, you know, not just for our first responders, but, you know, our park maintenance staff is out there. Uh, Luke's out there. I'm out there. We're in those areas and find ourselves with no ability to communicate via cell phone because there just literally is no signal in a lot of those areas. So um, if we can help with that, and again, a uh, large thanks to Mary Sackett. Uh, you know, we're dealing with behemoth agencies here, AT&T and Verizon. I don't expect immediate response from them, but they have been, you know, fairly responsive. And I do know that they have tasked their engineering teams to uh, at least research this to some degree. So hopefully we get some more no news as it comes down the line. That's it. Thank you, Eric. Um, any comments or questions from the board? All right. It's a good report, Eric. No questions or comments from the board. Um, how about from the public? Yes, one second. Uh, thank you. Um, and board members, uh, all of you, uh, you know, I do try very hard to treat each one of you with respect and to appeal to your uh, best instincts as, uh, uh, as people serving our, our community. I am very disappointed with uh, some of the interactions uh, that appear all too often, um, and uh, I think, you know, I think it actually represents harassment and is potentially actionable. Now, that would be only for a few uh, outstanding um, interactions, but it does get to that level of rancor, and I want you to basically rethink things, and I will rethink things. You're always welcome to talk to me privately if you think I've, I've uh, acted out of line. Um, but I am not going to put up with it. I put up with way, way too much abuse. And, uh, uh, you know, you can do better. You're, we're all adults. We're all parents, I think. And uh, we really set a bad example for the our children and, then, and the community. With regards to the uh, district manager report, um, uh, you know, I think it's, first of all, uh, it's just awesome that uh, the Case family is, once again, uh, doing wonderful things for our community. I think it's great. Um, I wish we had a little bit more detail on the park maintenance facility. I walk past it every day. It looks like there were some problems uh, with those uh, uh, metal poles that uh, Bill uh, wanted in front of the structure. I don't know what that's about, but um, hopefully we'll get that one, uh, get that behind us, and uh, uh, we can get this whole episode behind us and concentrate on greater things like building the Miller Creek Trail. Um, I do appreciate uh, that Eric has his attention on this project, but I would like to see a little bit more uh, action uh, and thinking about our last discussion on this, I realized that uh, perhaps our CITs uh, could be uh, help building trails this summer. Um, anyhow, good report, Eric. Um, keep up the good work, and we'll. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Stephen. Any other public comment? Uh, no, but I can clarify uh, if you would like really quickly. There's no issue with uh, what Stephen's referring to are actually structural support beams that are uh, uh, built into the structural design that go on the front. And there is no problems with those whatsoever. They're all functioning as proper and signed off on by the structural engineer. Great. Thank you for the clarification. All right, then um, we'll be moving on to park and recreation matters. Mr. Fretwell. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I will um, just touch on a few things in my report here. 
Um, as Eric noted at the beginning of the meeting, uh, the recreation staff is currently at um, in Sacramento at the California Parks and Recreation Society uh, annual conference. Uh, we we, sh we arrived today and we'll be coming back in a couple of days, um, which is a really um, amazing opportunity uh, for us to be able to come and take advantage of a bunch of educational sessions and trainings and symposiums on a whole wide variety of topics um, in the parks and rec industry involving um, new programs uh, and software equipment and um, techniques and things that we can hopefully um, learn from and adapt for our own programs when we come back. Um, we'll be excited to update the board uh, at the next meeting on just what we took away and, and some of the experiences we were able to have. But um, it's going to be a long week of um, just lots of sessions and hands-on uh, uh, trainings and things, and we're really looking forward to it. So uh, the, the training's off to a good start, and um, uh, and I'm speaking to you from, from a hotel room right now. So that's where I'm at. Um, just a few things. So the, uh, our Marinwood review, our spring summer catalog uh, came out on Friday, February 18th. Uh, it was mailed to around 19,000 local homes and businesses. Um, and our registrations and inquiries from about camp in the season immediately began, began uh, flooding in. Um, so we're really excited uh, to have kicked off our, our, our big marketing campaign for our summer programs. Um, there's a lot of anticipation for all of our summer programs. Um, the, the emails and the phone calls and the walk-in uh, questions have been steady, and uh, we're really anticipating um, a return to a normal um, normal summer, normal normal numbers this summer. So that's been great. Uh, staff's been working hard to finalize our staffing and all of the um, programs for summer. Uh, we talked a little bit about entertainment and things. Robin's got a lot of great uh, entertainment and special events planned for the summer camps. And um, we'll have more information about some of that as we get closer to summer. The, uh, some other big news, the Water Devils swim team started their practice on February 28th. And uh, it's been great to see the, the team back out there, to see the coaches and the parents and the pool just seems completely back to normal. Um, which has been a, a, a nice relief and we're really excited to have everybody back. The pool season opens to the public um, on April 4th and um, we're getting the last minute things ready for that. And we're really looking forward to, to all of that. We are seeing the return of the pool membership uh, this, this year. And so we've seen a lot of our veteran lap swimmers coming in to get their membership and, and sign up. And it's been really nice to see a lot of our um, swimmers that have taken a break the last couple of years for obvious reasons. I'm feeling comfortable to come back and, and return to the pool this season. So that's going to be um, really exciting. And um, uh, again, that's, that opens up on April 4th. Uh, our summer camp registration, I mentioned last time, but it's um, opening up on Monday, March 14th to Marinwood residents. And then on Thursday, March 17th to the general public. And so um, that's going to be a, a, a very busy time and staff's getting everything um, prepared and ready for that. Um, we are not, I think this was asked earlier, we are not opening up um, registration for non-residents uh, early who have a pool membership this year. So um, all non-residents will, will have to wait until Thursday, March 17th to register for camp. Um, another big uh, thing just to report on this last Saturday, March 5th, we had uh, our 11th annual raise a glass wine tasting event uh, from two to five at the community center. Um, I saw a lot of you there. It's uh, great to see everybody. It was a, a really good installment of this event. We, we had um, uh, 12 wineries uh, show up uh, this year, which was, which was wonderful. And um, I think one of our strongest turnouts we've had in the 11 years um, that we've done the event, um, everyone had a, a wonderful time and it, it went really well. Um, and we're really excited to kind of have a normal uh, event return to the community center. So um, that was a, a really nice time. And thank you to all the staff that, that put all the work in to put on a really lovely event. The weather cooperated and um, it was just really nice to kind of get back to normal with that. Our next event will be um, our spring art show on Saturday, April 23rd. And I'll have um, more details about that uh, at the next meeting. Um, so moving on to the park maintenance side of things, um, some, some really exciting news from just, uh, I just witnessed a couple of days ago. Um, some of the planting, well, most of the plantings we did along the creek bank uh, this last December 
uh, to try to curb the erosion issues we've been seeing. Um, almost all of them are, have sprouted leaves and seem to be growing um, and it's been, it's very encouraging. We were expecting under the best circumstances about 70% of these shoots to, to take and to start growing. And um, based on my count, it looks like we're closer to 80 to 90% of the shoots have started to grow um, sprout leaves. That doesn't mean they're all going to survive, but uh, it is very encouraging to see uh, so much leaf leafing on these, on these shoots um, at this point in the season. So I'll continue to monitor that. I'll try to include some pictures next time. Um, for, for all of you and, and just kind of show you what's going on with that. But um, we're very encouraged by, by the efforts we had um, in December and we'll continue to watch that and hopefully be able to um, see the banks get fortified this next season. Um, staff have been, have been hard at work uh, getting the pool um, all prepped for the season. They painted the bathrooms, uh, made some plumbing repairs, checked all the equipment in the pump room and uh, I've gotten everything ready to go. We'll, we'll still be getting a few repairs done to the pool deck this next month. Um, but things are pretty much on track um, for our opening on April 4th, and I'm feeling good about that. Um, uh, some unfortunate news. We did get a report on February 25th that uh, some trees in our open space received some vandalism and graffiti, um, some spray paint. And um, after documenting that and filing a police report, staff were able to, to spend uh, multiple hours working on removing that and were able to get the vast majority of the graffiti removed. Um, and we'll, we'll probably go back out and do a few more efforts to try to get that cleaned up. But um, uh, it's the first time we've seen something like that and it was disheartening, but um, thankfully uh, it, it looks like it's not gonna be lasting damage. So um, we'll keep an eye on that and we're working with the sheriff's department to try to make sure uh, we don't see this repeat or if it does to, to try to track down who, who's the you know culprit on that one. Um, but other than that, staff have been really busy uh, getting irrigation uh, fixed in a couple areas in the park uh, so we can get the water back on for the spring before the grass um, starts to die. And that's been going, going really well. Um, that's all I wanted to touch on on this report, but please let me know if anyone has any questions. Looks really good. Pool looks amazing. Everything seems to be smooth running towards the sprint for the last bit before summer. Thanks. And I'm super excited for the return of music in the park. Oh, yeah, me too. I want to thank you on behalf of all our water devils that you heated the pool before practice. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, pool's so nice and you. warm. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm not getting in, but they appreciate it. So. Based on the size of the bill, PG&E appreciated it as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Chris. Just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to say uh, thank you for Raise a Glass. Uh, formally acknowledge what a great event that was. Thanks, Bill. Totally agree on that. And I just wanted to point out that the, the lights that you guys installed, I, can't, I think oh. it last season, but the, but the lighting in pool is, is amazing. It's a total game changer, feels much more safe, and, uh, and it's very appreciated by the coaches yes. and the swimmers. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, that was a little bit overdue. I'm glad, glad we got it up to speed. Lots of oohs and ahs the first day, yeah. <laughs> I, I bet. <laughs> I don't even think the kids remember what – the pool looked like before the lights. So, and thank you for the new flags. Not the checkered ones that were there last week. We're getting there slowly, slowly but surely. Kathy. Yeah, the right ones are up this time. So, thank you. So, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, anything from the public? Yeah, yeah uh, great job, Luke. Uh, just a few uh, quick things. Um, I did mention uh, uh, the catalog. You know, I, I gosh, it seems like you're not getting much advertising uh, in that catalog, and I, I do think at some point that needs uh, that whole project needs to be reviewed. Maybe it'd be better off served with a more with on a, a, a better website or 
something else. It's, it just seems like a waste of money to me in a way. Uh, but it could, if we got enough advertising, of course, it could pay for itself. Um, uh, now, you're up at the Expo in Sacramento, and uh, I think that's great. I guess there's a trade show uh, that goes along with that, and hopefully you can talk with uh, some uh, uh, people that do play structures uh, and get some, uh, maybe get some information on how we can make our park more beautiful. Um, I'd love to, to learn about... Uh, splash pads and whether that would be feasible in our facility um, so you're you're at the spot where I guess a lot of people are uh, looking for business so I, I hope you make use of that your time there to to talk with the reps um, other than that I, I don't have too much to say um, oh uh, on the, as far as the graffiti there was one actually one other thing I w did want to say um, I did run into a woman that uh, saw some kids doing graffiti on the bridge. Um, I can't think of her name. Chris, you, you know her name. She lives right uh, where that the Miller Creek Trail will go in, right to the right, uh, Cardoni or something like that. Um, she did see the kids, so if you're, you're trying to track down who, who this was, I, it looked like young kids. They also hit the red bridge going into uh, Miller Creek, um, and I don't know what the arrangements are for maintenance on that bridge, but it does need maintenance. It needs painting. You've got rust there. You've got graffiti, and it looks like some boards to be, need to be replaced. So that's a project that um, you need to look at and you need to take serious. We don't want people falling into the creek because a board's rotten or or have to replace that bridge because we didn't uh, uh, get the rust off and paint it properly. So I, I do think that's a project that needs to go uh, high on your schedule, maintenance schedule. Other than that, good, good work. We'll see you again. Steven. Thank you, Stephen. Um, just to clarify, the, the red bridge is um, owned and maintained by the school district and, and not um, under the CSD's purview just for that. But thanks for the information about the um, possible graffiti. Do we need to reach out to the district or? I might, know, already I, know. I might know a teacher there uh, who I could talk to offline. I mean, I don't know, maybe somebody who's sitting here on the screen. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, we can we we can help. I'm sure they're aware of it, and uh, we've had conversations with them about that bridge. But it that's uh, actually goes more into yeah facility maintenance for uh, the school district as a whole. So uh, I know that bridge is on their radar, and they keep an eye on it. Great, great. Well, unless there's um, any other pub public comment, um, we can move on. Thank you, Luke, for the report, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank Agreed. you. Everyone. Thank you, Luke. Have a good night. I'm out. Enjoy, Zach. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on. Chief White. Actually, wait. Fire department matters. We're going to start with, oh, the fire commission meeting. So that would be Director Kilkenny. Uh, hello. I don't really have much to add because we had a very efficient <laughs> short meeting, and I don't want to take Chiefs White's thunder around away. Um, but um, I want to just publicly thank our com fire commission members for their time and effort and their great input. So take it away, Chief White. I'm out. Okay, we got to re review any, any, um, anything from the board, questions around the draft minutes from the fire commission meeting. Uh, anything from the public? Um, I believe so. One second. Stephen. Actually, I didn't really have anything to say. So, uh, Terry Forth, other than the fact that uh, it's, you can't tell what went on and because we don't have a recording, it's anybody's guess. So I don't think that's... Uh, Honestly, I think uh, you need to revisit your, your policy 
um, why these people refused uh, to be recorded uh, is kind of appalling in my view. Uh, I don't know of other agencies that keep uh, public meetings uh, private, but we have the ability, we have the technology, it's just a matter of uh, uh, saving and publishing it uh, to YouTube, and there can be better outreach into our community. This is not a private club, guys. It's it's a public agency, and we you all are public servants. And uh, uh, even though maybe not everybody is fascinated in local issues like me and some other people, it's still your responsibility to to be public. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Chief White, floor is yours. Good evening, District Manager Drykosen and Board of Directors. Um, uh, <clears throat> thanks to Commissioner and Board of Director Kilkenny for the efficient remarks. <laughs> so that being said, I'll try to be as efficient as I can with this report as well. Um, I'll start with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, where there's a uh, work underway for this uh, upcoming work plan. And so there's been an ad hoc committee established. Uh, we met uh, just well over a week or, or so ago. And uh, there'll be a report out on some of the meeting outcomes on the March 15th Ops Committee meeting upcoming. We had a vegetation specialist, or excuse me, vegetation management specialist ad hoc committee that was formed to determine what would make sense for the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority team and their efforts to provide for a lot of the work and lift for multiple agencies that a vegetation management specialist could perform. Uh, we have some in San Rafael. I believe there are some in Novato and the county has some, but for some of the other agencies, there's still a heavier lift. And so that committee was formed with the intent of evaluating the, um, the value, the, the source of funding and the importance of that role. Uh, and so we've landed on at least one individual initially, and that individual will uh, serve initially to help with the chipper program and administer the chipper program throughout the county. Um, that committee, though, is being disbanded and has morphed into the finance and budget ad, ad hoc committee. And uh, with that, they wanted to bring on a little more leadership in the way of um, either a city leader or other county or district leader. And so an individual named Dave Donnery was invited to join that finance ad hoc committee. Um, some of the things the ops committee will be doing this year is getting a, a better sense of what larger scale projects can be funded this year and receive some attention and, and needed resources. Um, additionally, there'll be some uh, messaging that I think they, they really want to influence the community outlook and perspective on becoming a wildfire adaptive community and um, kind of refrain from using terms such as fire season, starting to become an antiquated term as we look at what's happened given climate conditions, given the, um, the drought we've been facing, given the fact that there's been incidents pretty much year round now. Um, some are still happening more in the, the fall and uh, late summer months, but that being said, we just, we saw recently fires erupting in other areas of the state um, and not far from us in some instances here in February and March. And so we're moving to a term of looking at ourselves as being the annual is the season and becoming a, a wildfire adaptive community is the new approach to helping people understand how to live and or adjust to this new reality. Uh, roadside work continues and while we're also looking at Zone Haven and some of the evacuation related activities, everyone really truly understands why it's important to continue to create um, emergency ingress and or egress pathways through responsible um, vegetation removal and ensuring that there's um, a countywide approach to trying to um, ensure that pathways exist uh, in some of the critical areas. And so that effort will continue. Um, the uh, advisory technical committee is actually looking at projects and trying to cost them out. And so once they've arrived at the figures, it will be helpful to staff so that they can get a sense of what the available funding will be for each agency. And that's coming from the core allocation. And so um, 
while home hardening and defensible space effort continues, there's really just a, um, an added emphasis now on also trying to provide some of the existing grant funds that are now, you know, starting to be um, provided to individuals who are applying for grant funding. And so we, we encourage folks to, uh, and as I indicated, I believe in last month's report, we encourage folks to continue to apply for um, grant funding, even for projects that they may have completed last year. They'll be required to submit evidence of their expenses, photographs, things of that nature to, to demonstrate that they actually had a significant ex expense and they've um, worked on some of those things this last year. But that being said, um, there's also a, a discussion emerging on how the grant program is going to work consistently throughout the county or yes, throughout the county and from agency to agency. And so that may be something that eventually is going to um, evolve to either increase funding for different grants or um, adjust the criteria that grants uh, will be provided for, whether they be need-based or just based on priority and demonstrated risk. But they're encouraging everyone to apply for grant funding upfront. And so far, um, there may be an increase in that grant funding also by virtue of the increase in the measures um, uh, total monies received this, this past fiscal year. So that's something to be determined uh, somewhere down the road as we kind of get a better sense of what the projects look like and what available funding we have for that purpose. I'm gonna move towards guidelines and COVID-19. Uh, as I think was stated earlier, as we move towards a more, I think it was uh, Director Case who spoke to um, what appears to be us moving out of a pandemic towards an endemic. And I certainly hope that's, that's true. Given that um, just uh, under a month ago, the Marin County Health and Human Services um, made a determination and issued a public health order for our um, first responders, law enforcement, police, and fire, and now mandates vaccination. And that, <clears throat> that mandate required by March 1st, individuals to attest to their status and or by April 15th to be fully vaccinated and or updated. Given that, as you can imagine, there's quite a, um, a bit of frustration among some of the individuals who are opposed to vaccination, either for medical or religious reasons or otherwise. And um, on the 15th of uh, February, Dr. Lisa Santora of the um, Marin County Public Health Agency decided that she would have a town hall meeting and fielded a lot of questions on her own. Um, and I gotta say, I think she did an admirable job of trying to explain the county's position. And in short, it just appears that because of the unpredictability of variants and the unpredictability of where we're going as a society with our vaccination rates and or the potential for new variants to surface, I think the county wanted to take a proactive position to ensure that we were, do we're reducing the risk to our communities, those vulnerable communities and populations that we serve, the elderly, the skilled nursing facilities, the youth, the unvaccinated, um, and even our coworkers. Uh, I gotta say, I, I questioned the timing initially myself, but ultimately as I think about the Omicron virus and how infectious it was, and then now you're hearing information about how infectious it was and how many people died who were vaccinated, and still caught the Omicron. It starts to give you the sense that if there's gonna be future variants, there's a strong possibility that a variant could be as infectious as the Omicron, but as deadly as the Delta. And so those are the things that we have to be worried about as we move forward. Um, and I certainly hope this is just more um, of a anticipation than an actual potential reality. But I think um, science is looking at this as something that, you know, as they watch the, the variant surface, this is a very real possibility. And so in order to get ahead of any potential staffing impacts, in order to get ahead of possible um, uh, service delivery impacts and things of that nature, it was just a proactive effort. Um, we'll see where things lie in about six months or 12 months from now, but uh, for right now, that's the order and we're following the order as per the direction provided. Um, Vaccination. Wow, I've got to tell you, um, it, it's, it's strange to hear about vaccination and the different types of vaccinations that exist uh, using messenger RNA is what Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson did, uh, excuse me, Janssen, also known as Johnson and Johnson. There's another company um, 
Sanofi, which has produced a protein-based vaccine candidate. And it, I guess it uses what's been traditionally the way a vaccine would operate. And it says it's very effective, roughly 75% very effective um, against moderate or severe, severe COVID. Um, that being said, there's also drugs that are being created right now, both from Pfizer and Merck, uh, who have higher levels of um, preventing or reducing hospitalizations and death. And so those drugs are supposed to be taken early on in the infectious stage. If someone's experiencing mild symptoms, as an example of COVID or flu, you're supposed to take the drugs within that you know, first, uh, I'm assuming, incubation period or so. And those are supposed to work and prevent the protein from re replicating within your system and binding with the human cells and thereby preventing the, the virus from really becoming damaging. And so it's encouraging to see that there's other developments on the horizon that'll prevent um, potential illness and or um, long-term COVID and or death from the virus and or the fact that vaccines wane. Um, and that's a whole other conversation. We're not gonna get into that tonight, but. Uh, just to hear that, you know, there's so many different things taking place right now that are looking to um, capitalize on the need, but also simultaneously protect um, human life. It, this is very encouraging. And one of the things I found interesting was some information I received regarding what's considered to be herd immunity. Right now, I'm understanding across the country, we're roughly about 72, 73 percent. And that to actually achieve herd immunity or have a real good chance or fighting chance of becoming um, safer through herd immunity, you're required to be at least in the 90 percentile with your vaccination rates. And so um, given the, the, the rift that exists currently in our society, I don't know that we're ever going to achieve 90 percent. So it looks kind of unlikely, at least in the near future, that we're going to ever achieve herd immunity in our country if the vaccination rates stay about or hover about where they are or drop. So um, more on that to follow, I, I'm sure as things um, continue to develop. Uh, happy to announce also that the American Red Cross is resuming their in-home and in-structure and in-facility visits. Uh, after a couple of years of not um, feeling comfortable and safe, they finally decided that they're going to resume the Sound the Alarm, Save a Life smoke detector program. So given that, um, we received several smoke detectors. Uh, I have not issued them to staff yet. I wanted to provide some specific direction on um, one of the requirements that American Red Cross has in the way of capturing data about who they provided the, the um, smoke detectors to. Once we do that, they'll be available for anyone who has a need and hopefully our personnel will either see it at, uh, when they're on an EMS call or at some other instance, uh, recognize when somebody's got an outdated uh, smoke detector um, and, or one that uh, is non-existent and offer these up to provide the um, the benefit and value that smoke detectors have, especially the 10 year smoke detectors that we have now with the lithium batteries. So that being said, they, um, they're, they're back in full swing and, and really encouraged to work with fire departments to continue their efforts to now do direct outreach into the communities. And last but not least, we have our monthly report. At the time this report was generated, it was probably right around three plus weeks into the, um, the month. And so given that, um, our times increased slightly. We're just above six minutes, which, you know, it's probably about 30 or so seconds off of our normal mark. I don't know what to attribute that to. Um, that being said, if we kind of got the last several days of data, maybe that would have changed. February was a short month, but still nothing to be concerned about because it's an excellent response time. So. You know, I'm always smiling when I see something sub six minutes. This is slightly above, so I'm not smiling quite as much, but I'm still happy. Uh, that being said, um, we had 98 emergency calls in February up to that point, and a little under two-thirds of those were considered medical calls. Two of those calls involved a COVID-positive or suspected COVID-positive individual, and we didn't have any fires up to that point in the month. I don't think we ended with any... Um, to my knowledge, for the entire month. So knock on wood there for the months of March and moving forward. That being said, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you, Chief. 
Thanks, mm -hmm. Chief. Um, my question is, uh, I, I really like appreciate everything that um, you guys have been doing in the Marin County uh, Wildfire Association, everything like that. How, like, if I'm not in these meetings, I don't think I would know how to get to like these grants or the chipper program or anything like that. And I'm just wondering how, how that's being spread to the more general public and, and how we might as a district be able to support our um, community members, uh, you know, getting, getting these resources. That's a great question. I think uh, there's a couple of sources you could look at right away. Um, you can go to Marin uh, Wildfire Prevention Authority and their website. You can also go to firesafemarin.org. There's a lot of information that both agencies are, are sharing on their uh, website so that people are informed and understand what resources, resources are at their disposal, understand what dates, for instance, the chipper program may be operating in their neighborhoods. Um, and so those would be two of the areas I would say first and foremost to, to try to access and just look at that content. There's a lot of informational um, and educational materials on both sites as well so that you can become a lot more familiar with some of the efforts that are currently underway. Um, perhaps learn a bit about Zone Haven and the effort there. Um, learn about you know, our house outward approach that we've been speaking to and we're gonna to continue to emphasize with the community. Um, defensible space, just um, you name it, any number of things that, that pertain to ensuring that you're informed. Uh, there's information on how to become a firewise community. Uh, there's information on um, a wide variety of topics that help individuals kind of get acclimated and oriented to what's going on here specifically in, in Marin County. So I would just say go to the websites first and foremost. Um, I think one of the things we're also looking to do um, is provide direct conversation with staff when we're out conducting our inspections, or excuse me, not with staff, but with the community members as staff is out conducting the inspections. That's certainly a great time to educate um, um, members about where they can learn more and contribute and or get information that's relevant to them and their communities. As I stated before, the Zone Haven platform, as an example, you wanna know your zone campaign. That's information that our members wanna know so that when, they're, when something occurs, they can know right off the bat whether or not something is affecting their zone or something adjacent to them and start being prepared in the event um, there's a, a situation that they need to be apprised of. So I think there's a variety of sources there. It's just, um, you know, and it probably to your point might not be a bad idea. if We generate a one page flyer as an example that we pass out when we do our inspections and leave that flyer as something for people to reference. I'm old school. I prefer sometimes you know, things that are handwritten and, and easily to access instead of me having to search through technology to find it. Um, but that's certainly a way that we might want to approach, you know, getting good information out about some of those various things that we know um, will, will assist the community in understanding what's going on. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I could see doing something through schools or something too, because everybody's, you know, a lot of community members are connected that way. Something to think about, because I think there's so many great resources. I just think the average person in the community doesn't know how to access them. Do we, do we have links to those websites on our website, Eric? Do you know? Uh, we have a link, I believe, and don't quote me on this. I was just actually yeah. thinking about this uh, to the Marin wildfire website, which is, you know, where I would direct people to first and they go from there. And then to follow up with what chief white said, um, the MWPA and, and with fire safe Marin just, literally today sent out to participating agencies um, information regarding upcoming chipper days for this season and uh, information on how to do that. So um, literally just got it today. We'll work on, you know, just kind of sharing that. They even put, you know, put together a little PDFs um, okay. uh, with the info and we'll also, you know, blast it out via social media and then mention, cause you know, those two things really kind of go hand in hand right. too. It's uh uh, because, you know, the grants aren't huge, but they help. And if that's to, um, you know, cut down the stuff and then you combine it and time it with the chipper day, which somebody will come and then haul it away, you can actually get a tremendous amount of work done for that amount. So, um, kind of, you know, and then to Chief's point, um, and uh, he and I and, uh, and uh, Quinn Gardner, uh, uh, you know, need to kind of look at how are we going to what are our goals with the home assessments this year too? Cause we've hit them the last two years in a row 
um, with every house basically in all of Marinwood and Lucas Valley getting at least one, if not two assessments in the past two years. Um, so just what is the best, smartest approach and use of those funds on doing that too. Um, but yeah, so it, it's kind of a lot of the info to go out of, hey, there's grants available to remove this stuff. Uh, the you know professionals are coming by with recommendations on what should get removed. And then there's also an opportunity to get it hauled away for free. So, right, um, right. you know, it's kind of that triple prong approach that is trying to, in essence, you know, lead that horse as close to water as we can possibly <laughs> get them and make it as easy as we can for them. Totally, totally. Yeah. And the home hardening piece too, I think was an interesting one. I, I'm not even sure I completely understand what's available through those grants, but um, when I read the websites, I got to go back and, and look again. Yeah, so, I did I a quick look up because we were asking about this. There is a defensible place buyer, but there's nothing about grants to help you home harden. And then there's the open space, neighbors improving safe, uh, fire safety. But there is the firesafemarin.org that's linked there, but it doesn't have a like a thing saying, if you go here, there'll be information about these sorts of things. So maybe possibly... Um, I don't know if we need to work in coordination with you, Chief, to update the fire department area on the website or, but yeah, which, sorry. I'm sorry, which website were you on? The Marinwood website. Okay, I see. So I yeah, went to we, the Marinwood Fire Department and then I did um, wildfire prevention. Yeah, we can certainly and, look at yeah. all that. And I'm sure it could use some levels of updating. Uh, and things like that too. So uh, we'll take a look at that. And uh, we have staff here that can help kind of put some stuff together if we tell them what to put together. And maybe if you want to add, sorry, symptoms in here, the um, stuff that you just announced about the American Heart Association, not sorry, not American Heart Association. I work with those people, uh, <laughs> Red Cross, that um, maybe with the smoke detector program, you might want to put the link in there for that. I don't know. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Do we not have a huge, like, um, a place to sign up to receive, like, an email list, like, to to be able to do an email blast? Do uh, we, we do. Media? Most of that is through our. Uh, Active net registration system on the rec side don't really necessarily have that in place, uh, uh, nor necessarily dedicated staff to kind of be on top of that uh, from the fire side. And I think we rely a little bit more on kind of those uh, mass broadcasts uh, via social media okay. for those. Um, no, I'm not asking to implement it, I'm just asking. Yeah, not necessarily on the fire <laughs> side, uh, but you know, I, I know fire or fire safe, fire safe Marin certainly does. And the wildfire authority certainly has uh, where's places where you can register to get updates on information coming through there. And for us, um, I would steer most of these things back towards those two agencies rather than try to play an intermediary. I, I agree. I'm just, my thought was maybe even sending a, having a link I, and it could be on our page, but sign up for information, like a comment that says sign up for information, click here and go to that page. Right. right. So directs them where to go sure you know just a mm -hmm. thought but try not to add more to your plate <laughs> now it, it, we need it's been a while we need to go through and look at all aspects of the website on what needs to be updated it's just something we should you know have a a better more regular practice of doing cheap white can handle it that's okay <laughs> <laughs> well, i'm gonna have to delegate it because i certainly don't have the skills <laughs> <laughs> nice all right. Um, any comment from the public? Uh, yeah, one second, please. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks for the report, Chief. Um, you know, uh, I, I appreciate the, the updates every month, and I understand that uh, uh, the uh, safety uh, uh, employees uh, are under a special uh, requirement to be vaccinated. And I, I'm a little concerned, Chief, because in your report, um, uh, you, I'm sure you're parroting or, or, or you're, you're 
reporting on what you've been told by uh, Dr. Lisa Santora, but uh, some of the stuff that you said is contrary to some of the science that I've heard, and I would just caution you to um, uh, to to have a bit of humility and listen to your staff in their um, request to accommodate uh, uh, the public health orders. Um, I really don't want to lose anyone over this these COVID vaccines uh, or or COVID for that all that matters. And one of the things you can do is uh, understand that not only is Marin way out uh, on a limb as far as a response to COVID, um, you know, if you look at, at departments nationwide, they're not experiencing the, 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 the problems that uh, we fear here in Marin. So, I, I, you know, you got to back up your guys. That's, that's all I want to say because without those guys showing up, we don't have, uh, we're, we're all a little less safe. And that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. So thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Can I respond, please? Yes. Um, Mr. Nessel, I appreciate your perspective. Um, I certainly um, understand that our members were on the front lines when the pandemic occurred and began. Um, we were some of the first folks that, that, that stood up and said we should be recipients of the vaccine. And there's a good reason for that. We're re responsible to protect the public. We're responsible to make things better. Uh, I would feel terrible if I was an individual who unknowingly passed on a deadly virus to someone else. And I'm actually supposed to be here to protect and assist that individual. One of the responsibilities we have as first responders is to do just that, make sure that we're protecting others. And so while my personal opinion is just that, it's my personal opinion, it just coincidentally aligns with the public health order that's come forward. Um, also know of individuals who've died from COVID. And I think sometimes when something doesn't hit home, people don't fully believe or feel like that it's something that they have to be overly concerned about. Um, to your point about what other agencies aren't experiencing, that's kind of like just the opposite of what my experience was. I know people who were in New York when the pandemic first initially occurred and all the calls they were running on were with COVID um, infected individuals who perished. And so when you watch and see something like that, we were very fortunate here in California that we didn't have that reality or that experience, but I'm quite sure if we had that experience here, um, it would have really resonated in a different way with not only the public, but also with first responders. And so um, even within the first responder community, there's a difference between um, accommodating but also recognizing that accommodation may come with significant expense or even be unachievable at times, especially when you start increasing the numbers of folks that may be looking for an accommodation. And I'm not here to say it's good, bad, or different. It's just some, certainly something that has to be acknowledged. I've watched staff in San Rafael and other agencies spend a great bulk of their time addressing COVID-related concerns for individuals who are not vaccinated or updated instead of doing the job that firefighters are normally responsible for doing or leaders are normally responsible for doing, they're spending a bulk of their time addressing COVID. That's not sustainable. And so I just, I wanna offer some differing perspective, but I certainly believe in trying to ensure that our members have the full opportunity to pursue a exemption and or an accommodation and then let the decision makers land on whether or not that's something that's truly achievable or if it's in the best interest of the coworkers and or public we serve. So um, I appreciate your comments, but I just wanted you to see, you know, maybe there's another side to this as well that you haven't really given a lot of consideration to. Thank you. And the, at least if you don't mind, I, I want to follow up the chief on, you know, just making it sure that it's very clear that, you know, this is a public health order. Um, this wasn't a decision that was made by employers or management within various agencies. This was a, an order given by the public health officer. It's not a recommendation. Uh, as an employer, uh, we have no choice but 
to follow it and to implement it uh, as it is. Uh, and in terms of exemptions, you know, that, that is, those are legally defined as well. So I certainly agree with Chief White in, you know, supporting the members and, and things like that. But, uh, you know, from an employment perspective, we don't get to pick and choose on this. This is an order that essentially has the, uh, the, the authority of law behind it. And so as an employer, we simply have to abide by it. And that's really not, there's not an option in any other direction. Thanks for that clarification, Eric. Um, all right, well, I, if, unless there's anything else, thank you, Chief, as always. My pleasure, we'll see you guys next time. And thanks again for the helpful suggestions tonight. Thank you. Have a thanks, great night, Chief. thank you. Right, you too, great good night. night. All right, so moving on then to item H, board member items of interest requests for future agenda items. On the future agenda, I do have uh, what uh, Director Case asked, and just in terms of separating out from the consent calendar, the resolution for remote meetings, so that way that could be uh, more fully discussed amongst the board and uh, looking at the potential possibilities of returning to in-person meetings. Um, and then obviously we have the pay schedule review process, but as discussed, that's gonna come a few meetings down the line. That was the one I was gonna suggest next. Thank you for that. Any others? I mean, you're going to do it, but the update on the facility and the maintenance facility, and then with where we are with sending out the requests um, for the eastern and western areas. Yeah, well, my goal and, uh, you know, kind of what I have, yeah. uh, have myself imposed deadline is by the time we get to the next meeting, that, that has already been sent out. And now uh, we'll just be in the process of waiting for that for that to close. Okay, perfect. Yep. But I'll certainly give you an update all the same. And then I guess, I mean, at that point, we will have had registration for the summer, just kind of so that we know in terms of budget, what we might've gotten in terms of numbers of kids coming in. Uh, Is that a reasonable request or no? Yeah, Luke will include that kind of information, I'm okay. sure in his report. And obviously there'll be a full blown, you know, updated draft budget that'll come right. in, that'll have, uh, 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 you know, our, our estimates on what we're expecting from both the revenue and its expenditure standpoint as related to, uh, you know, camp enrollments and expenditures and registrations. Okay, perfect. And then we had the thing about what other districts are doing in terms of, are they doing it annually or biannually and how are they doing their Yeah, no, that evaluation. was what I had already okay. just okay. mentioned. Sorry, sorry. That, that's a few meetings down the line. Okay, sorry. Right. But yeah, I mean, at any point for, you know, gathering information, we should be holding on to it to share when the time is right. Correct, please. I okay. Think, yeah, um, sorry. I think too, just in the really big picture. Um, so I'm not, you know, as the the housing starts to get sorted and, and I realize this is going to be way down the line, but um, we, I think we need to start taking into consideration what is going to be the impact on Marinwood? Um, and, and so as that starts to clarify, um, I'd love for us to start looking at, wow, what do, what do we need to do as a, as a district that is totally under our control? I realize the housing element is not those that we're not the decision-making body there. Um, but certainly as soon as decisions are made and it sounds like they're going to be made sooner rather than later, that we need to figure out how that's going to impact the services that we currently offer and like, how's that going to impact us financially? Um, you know, there's a lot of different ramifications. So just to keep that on our radar as that starts to get finalized and, and moving forward, I think um, probably happened quicker than we all think given the, given the push. If I could chime in on that a little bit, to Chris, you know, and what my understanding is, is, you know, they're still kind of whittling down identifying these sites. And then from there, these sites will go through a much more full blown environmental impact review. Environmental impact isn't just like the natural environment, but it, it looks at everything, the impact on schools, on services, uh, uh, you know, everything that it would 
Uh, I would fully suspect that we would actually most likely be contacted for feedback into that process in terms of how it could impact the services that this district is responsible to providing. Uh, you hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, what types of positions the board or the district can take is, you know, related to how it would impact the services we provide and our ability to provide those services. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, of course. Did I understand correctly when I was looking at the various housing that there's multiple ones that are being suggested within our area? There are, there are. Okay. I would uh, push you, like three? you know, toward, towards the county and the housing element to have that conversation though. Yeah. No, I mean, I was just, I just, I, I read it and I was like, three, really? Okay, so. All right. Um, so then at that point, are we good to adjourn? Uh, you need public, public comment. Oh, public comment. Excuse me. Sorry, Stephen. One second. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and uh, thank you, Chris and Eric, to talk uh, for that information about the housing element. By the way, those meetings uh, are recorded. Uh, you can find them online at... Uh, uh, YouTube uh, under the county. Uh, also, you can visit savemarinwood.org. I, I think I have these uh, meetings up as well, so you can get some more information. Um, and specifically, Savon, um, uh, there's m many more than three uh, apartment complexes, potentially. Uh, one list has uh, about 2,300 units uh, to be added to uh, Marinwood Lucas Valley, units being housing units. Uh, and with the density bonus, that could uh, rise to about 3,500 units. Now, we only have in Marinwood CSD about 2,300 homes. So that gives you the idea of the kind of impacts that we may be experiencing. So uh, I think I, I have been on the meetings and I hope each one of you uh, gets on those meetings as well and renders your own independent um, conclusions on what's happening. Um, two years ago uh, in March 2020, uh, I stood up at the meeting, we were discussing the budget and I said, but have you considered the potential impact of COVID? and how that may change things. And that really was not discussed that night other than, oh yeah, that could be a problem. Hopefully it won't be a problem. And we had a big, uh, obviously, you know, since that time, two weeks to s slow the spread started that Friday and the rest is history. Um, we're also in a crisis right now uh, because of what's going on in Ukraine um, and the oil. And if you filled up your car, it's a lot of money. We're experiencing inflation. And that is another issue that I think the board should uh, potentially uh, look at that and, and how they may respond in the future to a highly inflationary environment. We're already there, but um, it, it may impact our programs and our staffing and everything else and we 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 should stay ahead of that problem so those two issues um and then lastly as always we need to improve the accessibility and maintenance in our parks uh i think it's unacceptable what how we ignore uh people that have mobility impairments in our parks. Uh, I don't think it's a, it's a very easy fix, but uh, uh, other than that, good night. Thanks, Stephen. All right, so then are we good to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. A no. second. Right. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> are we good with that a vote i we usually vote here do oh we need to vote to adjourn okay I don't know. all right let's call let, let's vote let's just, let's just do it it'll be fun right yeah, it'll be fun yeah. nothing else to do
<laughs> or <laughs> President Ruggieri. <laughs> Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. And Director Shea. I abstain. Noted. Thank you. <laughs> Motion passes. <laughs> Have a nice evening, everybody. Thanks for all of your input and feedback. It's very much appreciated. And uh, as always, reach out with any other questions or clarifications at any time. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you.